how much longer the Ukraine side can even continue to fight. And there's lots of physical evidence on the battlefield. Just just in the last 24 hours, there have been significant moves uh, in the Karakova area. Uh, Salidova has started to is, is now starting to be surrounded. Uh, Tourette's has seen a huge advance by the Russian army just in, in the last uh, uh, day or so. Uh, Seversk area, Kursk is now starting to crumble and that they're actually the Russian side looks like they're trying to cut it off at the neck, which is going to put all of these guys up there in this untenable position to where they're either going to die in place, surrender or to try to evacuate really quickly. I think they're running out of time everywhere you want to look on the front. It's crumbling from the Ukraine side, but from the Western side, you keep still hearing all these uh, comments about how we're going to continue to support everybody. Now, first of all, I want to show you here a comment um, uh, toward the end of last month by Zelensky, because this is this was on the eve of coming to the United Nations for uh, the UN Security Council. He wanted to get permission from Biden to use long range weapons and wanted more uh, gear, etc. But he wanted to come give his victory plan. Here's what he said then. Your victory plan, does it include negotiating with Russia? And how can you trust someone? It's, it's, it's not about negotiating with no? Russia, no. It's about, like I said, it's a bridge to diplomatic way how to stop the war. The bridge is the plan of victory or victorious plan. It's a strengthening of Ukraine, Ukrainian army and Ukrainian people. Only in the strong position we can push, we can push Putin to stop the war, diplomatic way. And only with a strong position we can speak. That's why we're asking our friends, our allies to strengthen us. It's very important. So let's try and just kind of parse what he said there and try to find out what his actual intent is. Because she asked him at the first of it, uh, does your victory plan include negotiating with Russia? And he said, no, no, there's no negotiation. But then a couple of sentences later in the same clip, he said, we want to be in a stronger position to have a diplomatic and political outcome. I mean, I thought that was the same thing. So I, if it's not the same thing, I don't understand what it is. How do you read that? Well, I mean, it, it, it's inconsistency to the point of absurdity. But I think what he's trying to do um, is he's trying to create some kind of international coalition, at least this is, this is the sort of theory of it, which will then come together, bring all the countries in the world together, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the global south, the west, and all of, all of those, and they will somehow pressure the Russians, force the Russians economically, diplomatically to back down. It's not going to happen. It is completely unrealistic. By this stage in the war, with everything falling apart, and with every indication, you know, that just ahead of a big BRICS summit meeting in October, the Russians have solid positions with all their various friends. It, it, it's far too late to be indulging these fantasies. And people should be telling Zelensky this. They should be saying straightforwardly, what you are saying, doesn't make any kind of sense. You cannot have a diplomatic outcome without negotiations. You must sit down and talk. You are losing the war. And there is only so much we can do to help you. We've done an awful lot. We can't realistically do more. Well, that, that's certainly what we should say, but that doesn't appear to be what we have said. So uh, here is, uh, I think this was, yeah, oh, this is today when Zelensky met with Keir Starmer. Watch this exchange. Very good to welcome you again you. back here. Very important we're able to show our continued commitment and support for Ukraine in this such important fight for you and for all of us as well. So very good to welcome you back to go through plans to talk in more detail about the work we can do together. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you for having us. Uh, me and my team, thanks to UK people, people of your great country, for your strength in our from the very beginning of the war. And today I want, of course, to share with you details of the victory plan. Yeah. We were so, so interpret for us, if you could, what is Keir Starmer actually telling him there? Well, he's telling him that Britain is behind him and that he should continue the war, which is very much the policy that we have in Britain. We have no real plan about how to 
um, end the war on favourable terms. We're not supporters of negotiations. We are. We have been consistently one of the most hardline and aggressive countries um, in terms of this war. And the new government that came in in Britain, the Starmer government, has gone exactly where the Conservative government did, the outgoing one did, except it's gone even further. Its rhetoric has been even harsher. It's been talking about missile strikes deep inside Russia. It's been wanting to step up, get the West to step up, support for Ukraine even more. Even though, as I remember you saying way back in 2022, when it all started and you've been proved absolutely right, there is no pathway to victory. Now, at that time when you said it, well, it was optional to disagree, but you've just described the military situation. And well, there it is. Nobody's really addressing the problem that all of these places are either about to fall or are being surrounded and that the Russian army is closing in. Um, that isn't something that people want to talk about openly. You find it written about in the media, some places, not all as much as they do, but Keir Starmer just carries on exactly as if as if it was early 22, exactly where Boris Johnson started back in 2022. We are all fully behind Ukraine as long as it takes, as long as it takes for Ukraine to achieve victory, even when it's obvious that it's crashing to defeat. Now, you know, I, I would have liked to have hoped that, well, that's just what Starmer said in front of the cameras, but when they got back off stage, you know, behind when, when they were just having their actual one-on-one -on -one meeting that he would then tell him maybe something similar to what you did that, look, here's the reality. You're, you're just not going to be able to succeed, but, and I'm not completely sure if this came before or after, but I think it came after you had the new secretary general Ruta come out of his meeting with Starmer and said this. When we discuss Ukraine, we know it's tough uh, because the Russian are more making small advances in the East by the way, at a considerable loss of life on the Russian side. So they lose a lot of people, uh, people dying, people getting seriously wounded, but still the Russians are making those small advances. We are not only into this uh, because of the fact that we want to support Ukraine. Yes, of course, that is the main reason. But also because supporting Ukraine in this fight against Russia is crucial for our collective safety here in this part of Europe, in Canada, in the United States, all over NATO territory. Because if uh, Putin would get his way uh, in Ukraine, that will mean a serious security implication, have a serious security implication for all of us uh, in NATO. Okay, let's do a little review of the bidding here, because he made a really big statement there that, oh my God, we've got to stop these, this crazy hordes at the gate or they're coming for all of us to Canada and the United States. Even he had even somehow he's going to get across the, uh, the Atlantic ocean. I uh, didn't talk about that, but uh, don't ask those questions. He just will. But then he also started off that sentence talking about how that Russia is inching along on the Eastern front. And even though they're making, they made some pretty good moves in the last 24 hours, when you're looking at it over the course of two and almost three quarters of a year now, what by what logic do you say that that same Russian army is going to suddenly pose a threat to a 32 member military alliance? Well, I mean, it's an absurd idea. It, I mean, it, it is completely ridiculous. The idea that, you know, we've got to stop them in uh, Selidovo or Kurakovo, or they will be marching on The Hague and London and Washington. I mean, it's just, I mean, oh, it, it, it is so detached from reality that, you know, one, one just doesn't understand whether these people uh, really have thought this through or believe it themselves, because it, it, is, it is ludicrous. It is completely ludicrous. All it is doing, is prolonging a war which is destroying Ukraine. If you want a security, if you want peace in Europe, the way to do it is through di negotiations and diplomacy. And there are routes to that. I mean, it, it, the Russians have said they're open to negotiations. If you don't believe the Russians, the friends of the Russians, China, Brazil, India, they've all said they want to see negotiations. So you can actually find a route back through negotiations. But of course, 
Ruto isn't talking about negotiations. He says, we've got to go on supporting Ukraine, even though, you know, they're being pushed back because, you know, if we don't stop them there, they'll come and attack us here. I mean, it, it is a fantasy. It is, uh, well, I mean, I just don't have words, further words to talk about it. And, you know, it's it's not like, you know, Europe is, is behind all this. I mean, we obviously have with Viktor Orban in, in Hungary or with Fico in Slovakia. Uh, you can even add in... Uh, Erdogan from Turkey. Now, even uh, Schultz in Germany is also saying, hey, you know what? It's really time to talk. So you mm -hmm. see that there's a definite fissure going on in Ukraine. I mean, sorry, within NATO. So there does seem to be a growing amount of space to say, wait a minute, what are we doing here? Now, on top of that, you had, there was supposed to have been in two days, there was going to be a, a meeting in Ramstein, Germany, where uh, the president was going to show up this time, along with the Secretary of State. But now all of a sudden, yeah, they canceled that. Uh, Biden ostensibly didn't go because of, you know, watching the hurricane blow through Florida here. But, you know, that happened last night. That wouldn't have stopped him from going there. And by the way, I don't know that he's going to really help that too much uh, in Florida. But uh, be that as it may, he canceled. But then so also did the secretary of state. And then finally they said, you know, we're just going to cancel the meeting altogether. So now at a time when you got Zelensky trotting around Europe saying, hey, I need a bunch of stuff, and then the meeting to give him this stuff gets outright canceled, what does that tell you? Well, uh, as a British person, it tells me that Britain is at very serious risk of being isolated in this issue because we are demanding that there should be no compromise on Ukraine. We are going along with hardliners like Mark Rutte, and some of the people in NATO, the secretariat in NATO. But it is clear that the ground is shifting under our feet because people across Europe, where, by the way, the economic situation is very poor, partly because we, because of this war and its blowback and its consequences, which nobody thought through properly, people in Europe are beginning to uh, rebel. They're saying, well, we can't continue like this. Ukraine is losing. The Russians are winning. We are, uh, our economies are suffering. We've got to try and see if we can find some way forward. And people in the United States, and this is how I interpret uh, the decision to uh, call off Rammstein at the last moment. Well, they've been hearing Zelensky talk about his victory plan. They've been hearing him talking about deep missile strikes into Russia. They hear the British backing this, and they don't want to. They don't want to go there. They don't want Ukraine at the moment joining NATO or deep missile strikes into Russia. And they're not happy that the British, for one, are advocating these things. So they're staying away from Rammstein so that they can avoid having to address those topics, having to argue directly with some of their allies, notably the British, some of the Scandinavian states, the Baltic states, um, even as ultimately they're saying no. So we in Britain are going to find ourselves isolated in this. Now, the problem is, <laughs> looking at the others, the others, yes, they do want i think they do now understand that ukraine isn't going to win this war that the question is how long before the russians win this war and that would be a that would be a very bad thing for europe after all this happened if the russians won the war uh, you know conclusively so we've got to find a way out but nobody so far is putting forward proposals serious proposals as to how to do it the Ukrainians, Zelensky, at the moment, is resisting the idea of negotiations. He ruled out negotiations, as you saw in that interview. And all of the indications are that some key governments in NATO, the British, Scandinavians, the Baltic states, some of the others, Mark Rutte in uh, uh, Brussels, they're still ne ruling out negotiations also. So we're going to have to find a way through to get some kind of dialogue with the Russians underway. And that's going to be very difficult because we are divided. And the Russians, for their part, have good reason now to be very skeptical of any ideas we put to them. But that is the only, that is the only realistic way forward. And it is the only humane way forward. And it is the only sensible way forward for Ukraine. But it's, I mean, self-evidently that should be to any rational 
thinking person. And look, the situation I just described to you the tactical situation on the main the main points of combat here a second ago. Uh, but then you look at things from the operational and strategic level, and they're even stronger in Russia's side. I mean, of course, their industrial capacity is just now cranking, you know, just like 24-7, 365 and expanding even. Uh, they continue to expand the size of their military now up to by the end of the year, it'll be around 1.5 million on active duty alone, which is 50% bigger than it was when they invaded in February, 2022. Now then we see that there may actually be some North Korean soldiers fighting on the ground in, in, uh, if, alongside Russia in Ukraine. And there's, we don't know how many are coming for the South Koreans have said they have intelligence on this report here. Uh, and, and so we already know that you, that, uh, North Korea is giving considerable ammunition support, whether that's artillery shells, rockets, and, and we don't even know for sure what else we just know. There are literally thousands of container ships, uh, uh containers being sent on ships over to Russia. Uh, we, of course, know that lots of support is coming from Iran. China is reported to be doing uh, a much more help to the Russian side than what's been publicly announced. So everywhere you look, that's the, that's the overall dominant theme is that everything in the cumulative West that we're doing is failing at every point. Now, on top of all this, here's what uh, Sergei Lavrov has said, that there is still an opening for... Uh, a diplomatic solution. We actually desire one to end the conflict, not just have a ceasefire. And he's point blank said that that's going to mean you're going to lose Donetsk, Kherson, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Crimea, and then there's going to be no NATO. Now, ironically, those some of those were were part of the the uh, uh, April 2022 deal that didn't happen in Istanbul. NATO was always going to be off the table, but those other territories could still have been in Ukraine. Now, the longer it goes, the worse it's, it's gotten. And so that's where we are today. Russia, subsequent to this, I think it was the deputy foreign minister, uh, also added that if those are not taken, the next time it's going to be even worse. So let me ask you then. Now, I get it that a lot in the West hate Russia. And whether it's, you know, leftover mentality from the Cold War or something else. I, I don't know. We just don't like them. I can get that. I don't may not agree with it, but I understand people don't like somebody. But when you look at all of those fundamentals I just laid out there and none of them are in our favor and they're not going to be. And the, by all rights, the, the probabilities are like 98% probability that the Ukraine army will eventually collapse just out of sheer weight for all this. And now that we're not will, worrying about whether we're going to fire long range weapons into uh, to Russia, we're going to see what are the terms of surrender. And then it's going to be so much worse for us then. Surely those kinds of calculations are not lost on even people in Washington and London. Well, I would sincerely hope so. I mean, I'm not sure about London, by the way. I mean, if you look at Keir Starmer and our foreign secretary, David Lammy, and listen to what they've been saying, I'm not sure that they do get it. But you are absolutely correct. Now, it is a tragedy that we threw away the possibility of peace that was presented in April 2022 in Istanbul. That allowed Ukraine to remain intact. They didn't even have to recognize that Donetsk and Lugansk, uh, the, you know, the regions, that those parts of the regions that the Russians still control. They didn't even need to re recognize that those had become part of Russia or Crimea. It was actually a very good deal for Ukraine. It was a very good deal for the West, by the way. Also, it would have ended the war and it would have secured peace and we would have been able to move forward and a lot of the disaster that we have we would would have been avoided it did not affect what was agreed in is istanbul or potentially agreed in istanbul did not in any way undermine core western interests now the interesting thing about lavrov's proposals which are basically Putin's proposals, he, he put them forward in June, is that they still do not, in my opinion, um, undermine or detract from core Western interests. I mean, why is the future of the West dependent on who is in control of Lugansk? I mean, I, I just don't get it. I mean, I really don't get it. So it's it's still a negotiation 
which perhaps we can you know argue around the edges we could say well you know maybe you can keep Lugansk we won't recognize it but you know for the moment we can find a way around at least we can negotiate on this and we can come out and we can preserve Ukraine and if we don't do this well then exactly as you say the overwhelming probabilities are that the Russians will move further west we will get into a situation where there is less of Ukraine to defend. The Ukrainians will have suffered even more than they have done. Their cities without power, their young, their people dying on the battlefronts, all of that. And then, of course, the Russians, having moved further west, they will demand more. And they will say, look, we've what we were offering in June 2024, uh, that's historic now. We, we're looking at new realities on the ground, and we've got to adjust to those new realities. And that's a difficult, difficult argument to push against. And then, of course, if we reject that, the point will eventually come when there is nothing of Ukraine left. I cannot for the life of me understand why we would want to be in that situation. And I cannot for the life of me understand why anybody who says that they care about Ukraine would want Ukraine to be in this situation. Yeah. I, what do you make of the argument that, that some advocates for continued support make that it, it would send a message? If we did what, what you know, Lavrov has offered here, what Putin said back in June, et cetera, or any version of it at all, and enter into negotiations that ended up with Russia getting something that they didn't have uh, on, you know, February of 2022, that that would send a signal, and if the China, for crying out loud, they would regard the weakness of the Americans. They especially saw with the withdrawal, the terrible withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021, and now with this on top of it, they would definitely move into Taiwan. What do you say to that? Well, I think again, it's absolutely absurd. I mean, it's the domino theory all over again. We've got to hold, hold back the Russians because if we don't hold the Russian back, the Russians, the Chinese will move. They will move against Taiwan. I mean, these are completely unconnected issues. Uh, I mean, the, the the Chinese of all people understand the true strength of the military balance in the Pacific and the enormous risks that they would run if they started an operation in Taiwan, which would be a completely different one to the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, I mean, there'll be the economic consequences, which would be extremely severe for China as well. Uh, I mean, th this, uh, this argument makes absolutely no sense on its own facts. But, you know, if that is your concern, if your concern was, you know, that if you make you know, find yourself in a war with the Russians and you lose it in Ukraine, that might affect the situation in Taiwan. Bad argument, though, that is. Well, that was that would have said try and avoid getting into a war in Ukraine in the first place implement the Minsk agreement, which was agreed way back in 2014. It was already on the table. It was all on the table. Do it uh, and avoid a war because as no less a person than Barack Obama, when he was still president, said in Ukraine, the Russians have the advantage. So you don't want to fight them there. Uh, it is obvious. But anyway, that's, I think I've said enough. So so let me ask you, in the last few minutes we have here, let, let's, let's say that we maintain our current course, which is to ignore reality and just keep this fiction in our own minds. And I'm talking about Washington and London primarily. Uh, and we're just going to keep saying, yep, support them as long as it takes, et cetera. <clears throat> and then the, I guess the laws of gravity take effect and Russia eventually wins. Whether they come up with a big arrow uh, operation, which is entirely possible in my view, uh, this this fall and winter, or whether they just stick with the current plan and just say, no, even if we have to go another, you know, six, nine, twelve months, we're eventually going to grind them down. That's that's going to get there. So whether whether it's quick or later, that will eventually happen uh, as long as Russia continues to fight. In that event, how do you think that the the West? And we'll stick with the UK if you if you want to stick there. How will they react when there's no longer the possibility of giving fiction because the, the war is lost and, and the Ukraine side has lost? What are we going to do then? 
Well, I think what we're going to be saying to ourselves is we've lost this war in Ukraine and there's going to be divisions in Europe. There will be some people, there will be some people in Germany, in Italy, in all of in Hungary, in all those places. And they say, look, we weren't completely in, in favor of this enterprise. Isn't it time to talk to the Russians? And there will be others like the British set who will say, well, look, you see how aggressive and how powerful the Russians are. And we must build up our defenses in Europe even more. And we're going to have tensions and arguments in NATO, which are going to be far worse than the arguments we have now. But think what would happen if the hardliners, the British, ultimately won that argument. And by the way, the hardliners have won all of the arguments consistently up to now with the results that we see. We would have another Cold War, another confrontation in Europe. We would ask the Americans, again, because it can only be the Americans, to send a lot of their army to Europe again to confront the Russians all over again. That would be a huge commitment of US resources in Europe to defend us from the Russians. And all of this at a time when the United States has problems in so many places, in the Middle East, in the Pacific, wherever you like. Economic, add that to the, because that's probably the more dangerous. Exactly, all of those. Do the, do the Americans, and it ultimately has to be decided, by the way, by the United States, do the Americans really want to be in this position? Surely, they should try and find an end to the war now on the terms that the Russians are proposing, which, as I said, do not undermine or affect Western security, security or core interests. It doesn't. And uh, man, you know, I, I, I wish that that was, that was you on the stage with Zelensky today, or the, I wish you were on Keir Starmer's staff to, to bring some of this rational logic, common sense into, uh, into some of his ears there. But uh, uh, I guess we'll have to leave it at that and let this be our speaking so that people can hear it. Because, you know, a lot of people are watching our shows here. We, we've seen some uh, uh, reporting here in recent days and really even the last couple of years that uh, more and more people are starting to turn away from mainstream media because they recognize just listening to it, that a lot of the stuff is just nonsense. And they, they'd like voices like yours that are telling it like it is that lines up with what they can see and understand in the world. So we really appreciate you coming on today and provide more clarity and, and vision on this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And can I just say they should also listen to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and in fact, if you guys haven't liked and subscribed, please do so today because we, we love to be able to, to give you information like this. We, of course, also uh, want you to know that we're on podcasts now, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcast Addict. Be sure to type in Daniel Davis Deep Dive and you will be shown right away to our podcast. Thank you very much. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.